Hello. <laughs> Good uh, evening. Nice uh, to see you all here for the people online also. Good to have you here at our first, very first interactive lecture in a collaboration with uh, Maastricht University and the Unlimited Network. Um, yeah, we hope uh, that you will enjoy today and um, we want to make it a very interactive uh, event. So in the meantime, we will ask uh, question, there are questions and uh, I will walk around uh, with the microphone. Uh, today we have our uh, guest speaker here, Car Professor Caroline van Heugten. She will uh, host our event with the title, What does being healthy mean to you? And uh, yeah, she is also a professor at the neuropsychology uh, faculty and the faculty of health sciences. And uh, furthermore, she works at uh, the Brain Institute and she's also a columnist at the Observant. That's true. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, Great. if there are questions in the meantime, Caroline can take it from here. And uh, well, yeah. thanks. So, welcome. I don't know exactly where the camera is, so I'll just talk a little bit. We have a few people here in the room, and we have a few people online. And it would be nice if it would be as interactive as possible. So, don't hesitate. I think you can put it in the chat. Somebody's reading the chat aloud, so we can have an interaction. I want to share my professional view and my personal view on living with a disability. And I now have a huge echo, so if somebody can take that away, <laughs> would be nice. Yeah, that, no, that's not better yet. <laughs> I have no idea how that works. So, let's immediately start with the proposition with a statement on which I think you can agree or disagree. So if the world would be inclusive, nobody needs to live with a disability. Would you agree? Somebody sitting here or somebody on the chat? Share with me your thoughts. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, it's always just in your face now, this statement, so I can imagine you need to think a bit about it, yeah. So if the world would be inclusive, nobody needs to live with a disability. Is that possible even? <laughs> I, yeah, sounds like utopia, somebody says here, and why is that? <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I just said, I think it uh, sounds like utopia. Um, if the world would be inclusive, nobody needs to live with a disability. But there's so many boundaries yet to take, I guess. So that's why I said, I think it's utopia. Yeah. We have a couple online yes. um, saying false, uh, they still live with it. Um, there's some but saying maybe it would not be called disability. And someone says, not really. Disability can be something personal too. And another person saying, not true. It won't disappear, but it might have more space. So I think a lot of, yeah, three different people with comments of disagreeing with this statement. Oh, well, that's good. That's a good start. So let me share then with you where my professional interest comes from to do this interactive work workshop with you today. So I study the consequences of brain damage. Uh, brain damage can occur during life. So you could, uh, for instance, get an accident and you fall on your head and you have what we call traumatic brain injury or elderly people often get a stroke. So there's something wrong with the blood supply in the brain which I depicted on the left side. So typically what we then look at is we first want to establish whether there is a brain damage and the neurologist does that with a brain scan. So in the brain scan they can see whether there are any deviations, brain abnormalities. Um, 
of course, at the moment that something happens, you don't know what the brain looked like before, so you're not sure how to interpret these abnormalities, but if there is something leaking, blood leaking, you know that that wouldn't be normal, right? And we as psychologists, then we try to see whether these brain abnormalities have consequences for, for instance, memory. Memory is something we study in psychology. And we typically do a memory test. And we say, well, these are the direct consequences. You can see something in the brain and that could lead to a memory deficit when I would do a test in a very artificial lab environment. And then the question is, will that lead to problems in daily life? And between this objective test and problems in daily life functioning, there is the subjective experience of the person involved. So you can imagine that if you would have memory loss, that you would forget appointments. You can imagine that. And if you would forget appointments, you may have problems in daily life functioning with your activities, maybe with your role in society, which we call participation, and that could hinder your quality of life. Now, what we know from my research is that that is not the complete story. Whether or not forgetting appointments will have an influence on your daily life depends on who you are. So, do you mind having these forgetful moments? So, are you anxious about it or do you feel okay? Do you feel at ease about it? That will influence how much hinder you will have from it in daily life. And the same is true for environmental factors. If you're a teacher, such as I am, it's not very handy to forget appointments. If I would have forgot this appointment, I would not, oh, or <laughs> this, this <laughs> appointment, <laughs> not this appointment. <laughs> um, I wouldn't be here today and giving this interactive workshop with you. So what we try to look at in our research is that we say we have what we call an integral vision on health. So the doctors may only lead, look at brain damage from a medical point of view. So there's something wrong in the body, in this case in the brain, and that will lead to consequences. And thus there will be a problem in daily life. And we say, no, 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 that really depends on who it is, in what context somebody gets this disease and its direct consequences. And I would even go so far as to claim that even without a brain damage, so even in the absence of a disease or an injury, the personal and the environmental factors are the most important that determine how you are active in your daily life and how you participate in society and how your well-being is about that. So to me, it really doesn't matter what kind of a disease or injury somebody has, just because it's my profession, I study brain damage, but it could as well have been something else. Um, and I'm not sure if you agree with that. Would you agree with that, that it doesn't matter what actually is wrong? So what is the cause of the disability? Does that influence participation in society, do you think? Or is that the same to everybody? Uh, yeah, for me, eh, it's more about the hindrance you experience from uh, uh, a disability, and it doesn't, uh, in fact, not really matter what kind of disability you have, but it's about uh, what you experience yeah. uh, as, a, as a person. Yeah, and then I say these ex experiences are influenced by personal and environmental factors. Would you agree? I agree. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But I also would say that uh, for someone to accept it, their own disability, it can be helpful to really understand what actually the cause was. So then it does matter for someone, but that can also be a personal factor. Yeah. Yeah. We also have some comments uh, on the chat saying that the way the society is arranged creates a lot of disabilities um, and it can influence how others perceive you. And there are quite a lot of people agreeing with 
both of these statements as well, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the environmental factors, that is for me how the society is arranged is indeed an important factor, not only your own environment, but also the society, yeah. So, um, as I told you, so I work in a medical context, so for me it was logical to start this discussion on the basis of a very old definition of health, and that is why we took the title of my interactive workshop, What Does Health Mean to You? And over the years we have come a long way. So, first of all, a very impressive organization who does a lot of good things for us, the World Health Organization, they used to have a very limited definition of health, saying health is the absence of injury and disease. Well, you can imagine that that is not true anymore. I mean, do you know anybody is completely healthy? Everybody has something, right? So even already in 1948, they said, well, it's not merely, it's not only the absence of injury or disease or infirmity, it's a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being. What do you think of that? Could you work with that? Could you live with that? Is that okay? Is that enough? <laughs> so they changed l health into well-being, I guess. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, let me give you a hint on my opinion in this. I really struggle with the word complete. <laughs> I think that's my main concern in this definition. I really like the fact that they moved away from no injuries, no disease, no nothing wrong, it's completely healthy, to, well, it's not about health, it's about well-being. But then why should it be complete? <laughs> yeah. So I think we're still not there, looking at this definition. But luckily they, uh, they move forward. So what they did in 1980, they proposed a framework where we can talk together about the consequences of the disease. So the World Health Organization found out, well, we shouldn't look at the disease, we should look at the consequences of the disease, because that is what somebody has to live with in their daily life. And they came up with a framework so we can share common language across the world. That's the idea of these frameworks. Um, and they said, well, you need to look at the consequences of the disease and three different levels of human functioning. So a disease could lead to impairments. Um, so in my example, a stroke could lead to memory impairments and impairments could lead to a disability and forgetting appointments. I'm not sure whether that could be named a disability, at least it's annoying. <laughs> and having a disability could lead to being handicapped, having a handicap. Well, I'll move away from this one very quickly because that's what the World Health Organization did themselves as well. Because this is too negative, right? This is indeed one step forward. You look at the consequences, but it's very negative. So what we are working with now at the moment is what we call the international classification of functioning. So it's the second wave. And there it's more, it's formulated more positive and there are more arrows in there, as you can see, because in this one, they suggested that every impairment would lead to the same disability, which would lead to the same handicap. We know now that that is not true. So what they said is, you need to look at it from a positive point of view, which I really like. So still, they put the disease on top, and you can discuss about that, whether that's good. And then they say, well, there could be changes in structure or function. So you can imagine if, you, if a leg is amputated, then there is a deviance in structure. But if your brain doesn't function well, we say, well, brain functioning is disturbed. Mental functions are also in there, visual functions, auditive functions, memory functions. And then they say, well, that could influence the activities you want to do in daily life. And 
that could have consequences for your participation in society. But what we know is that doesn't says it, says it all, because if you have two people with the same problem on the level of the disease or functions, they still could have different levels of activities and participation in daily life. So that's why they come up to, with two extra factors in this model. They say, well, you need to take into account personal factors and you need to take into account environmental factors or uh, yeah, external or environmental factors. And the idea was there that that could heavily influence all of the other parts in the framework. So imagine there are two people who um, can't walk and one of the two is doing sports in the Olympics and the other one is sitting at home and doesn't want to be seen outside without being able to walk. And that could be in the personal factor. So if you're afraid to show yourself not being able to walk, then you won't be participating in society while on the disease or the function level you could have the same problem. So I really like this model and we work with that a lot. But then the debate still is, is it too much medical still because health condition or disease is on top? So in 2011, a new definition of health was proposed by somebody from the Netherlands, actually a general practitioner, her name was Machtelt Huber, which led to uh, a new idea in healthcare, which they call positive health instead of health. And she defines health as the ability to adapt and self-manage. And I guess somewhere in the definition it should say, despite the presence of disease or disability or injury. So what do you think of that? Is that a better definition? It's the last one I have because we, are not, we, we didn't move forward since then. The ability to adapt and to self-manage. Yeah, so basically, I, I do not, even, uh, either I don't get the definition or I completely disagree because the whole thing is, I was entirely ill through my disability the last few years, would be a complicated story to, to tell now. But I was able to self-manage and to adapt, and if, if they tell me that health is the ability to adapt and to self-manage, then why could I still do this when I was entirely, completely broken uh, down? Uh, yeah. To be fair. Right? Yeah. So I don't. I don't see. I don't see the sense. No. Yeah. I can imagine. I also struggle a bit with this definition. Maybe somebody online. There's actually someone online who thinks it's great. So. Oh yeah. <laughs> but no further elaboration on that just yet. Myself, yeah. Maybe it's also that it looks like it's if a simple solution. Yeah. So that you have it, uh, it's under your control. So uh, that's maybe also why uh, it f feels not. I I uh, I can imagine that it it could help you, but then uh, the responsibility is completely by yourself. Yeah. Uh, and that's, yeah. Yeah, that's the problem I have as well. It's apparently you need to adapt and you need to take care of yourself. But what about the others? I mean, you can't do it on your own, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it, uh, to my taste, but I'm not sure where it really comes from, but to my taste, it comes a bit from a lot of research that has been done on living with the more classical chronic diseases. So the classic chronic diseases are di di diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, and COPD, so uh, airway, inf airway disease, chronic airway disease. Those are the three classic chronic diseases. And I think the idea was that they said, well, you have to adapt to living with this disease. We can't cure the disease and you have to adapt. And the self-management means we're not going to give you your medication every day. You need to be able to take your own medication every day. I think that that, that is what, where it came from, but I'm not sure. What I do like is that they 
um, have these di these dimensions. So they say it's not only about health anymore. It's about six dimensions and you can fill in a questionnaire about yourself and then you get kind of a spider plot and you can see where your strengths and weaknesses are on these dimensions. The problem is it was never op op made operational. So I know that there are especially many policy makers like the province of Limburg, they say we want to be the first positive, healthy province. <laughs> And then I, I'm always wondering, and what are you going to do for that? <laughs> How are you going to make this workable? <laughs> so it kind of it got a bit lost in, I think, in policy land. But maybe people who are a fan of this think otherwise. I think the people who are saying it's great seem to also think that's in comparison to the previous definition. Yes. It's definitely a step <laughs> forward, yeah, but That's we're not there yet. <laughs> no, um, yeah. and we had a couple of people asking, uh, yeah, I think the definition of adapt and self-manage, but I think you gave those definitions just now. Um, and there's also the comment that maybe health isn't the word we should be using, or we perhaps need to redefine health and well-being um, for these definitions to work. Yeah. Um, and yeah. there's also the comment that it doesn't say anything about the environment or the social environment. Yeah. Um, yeah, because again, somebody's agreeing that the environment can play a vital role in how you can function with your disability. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so let's look at these frameworks uh, that I just presented and uh, on the discussion on the basis of somebody. <laughs> Do you know who this is? Maybe some of the Dutch people know who this is. <laughs> no. Well, this is a Paralympic champion. So this is what we in the Netherlands used to call our blade babe. <laughs> Her name is Marlou van Rijn. And in 2016, she, she won the gold medal uh, on the Paralympics. And what I find is interesting always, when I look at interviews with her, you could say from a participation point of view, she's very successful. But then always, <laughs> when you ask people, why does she need the blades? What is wrong with her? The people who just realized who she was. Why does she need the blades? Yeah, but why doesn't she have feet? <laughs> yeah. What I really like about that case is that y nobody knows. <laughs> I, I really had to look deeply, look, investigate the internet to find out why they amputated both of their legs and part of their... Of both of their feet and part of her legs. Nobody's interested in that. So for, for some reason, when somebody is very successful, we move away from the medical model. We are not interested anymore in why there is an absence of function or why they had to amputate her leg. So I really like that, that apparently we are capable, not in, maybe not in a medical context and maybe, maybe not in a healthcare context, but in a societal context, we are capable of looking at the other end of the spectrum, the participation. So if I would take this uh, ICF model, this International Classification of Functioning, the doctor may um, consider her from a disease point of view. Apparently, she had some kind of uh, congenital disease which um, made when she grew up, she wasn't able to stand on her feet, and then they decided it would be better to just lose the feet. <laughs> um, so there's a, a lot of absence of function, um, but she's still participating on a very high level. And what I like, if you look her up on the internet and you ask her, or you read interviews with her, and when you ask her, why are you a winner? Where did your success come from? She mentions two things. She mentions personal factors 
and she mentions environmental factors. So she says, well, I'm persistent, I work hard, I'm a positive person, um, I want to win, so I'm motivated, but I also have the support of my environment. So my parents are very important for me, my trainers, my peers, and I'm not sure I looked it up whether that's an English word, gun factor in English, apparently that's the goodwill factor. She says there are a lot of people around me who who want me to win, who help me win. They are they are also helping me, they they want me to win. So basically here again if I go back to my own work of research, for me this is apparently doesn't matter <laughs> what is the cause of why she doesn't have two legs, she still is a winner. And, and what she says herself, that's mainly due to the personal and the environmental factors. So then we're back a bit at the beginning, but maybe these examples of brain damage and somebody winning the Olympics is a bit, or Paralympics is a bit, a far, bit too far away from where you are today, because you are students at this university. Um, and I think we already looked at this, um, so what I tried to say, and maybe now that you thought about it a bit more, where my question mark is, that optimal participation is completely, to my taste, defined by or determined by personal factors and environmental factors. We, we discussed that in the beginning, but maybe somebody wants to add now that I gave this example. Wants to add something to the discussion? Yeah, I, the only thing is then optimal participation becomes debatable in this uh, statement too, yeah. I would say. Because there could also be certain disabilities that someone is not able to participate but is optimal participating in their own personal home environment in the way they feel comfortable. Yeah. So then, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm on purpose I didn't put their maximal or maximum participation because we don't have norms for that, right? Mm -hmm. we, when you want to classify a disease, you know that when something is wrong, like your blood pressure is too low, then we can say, well, that means um, hypotension. So within a medical context, and even we as psychologists say, well, if you want to remember 15 words and you, you can only remember two words, we say, well, we define that as deviant. But when you move away from functioning and you move more towards daily life and participation in society, I don't know what the norm is. <laughs> so I don't know what a normal life is. And if somebody says, well, I want to work 20 hours a week while some but he thinks, well, no, normal work is 40 hours a week. Then that's why I wrote optimal and not maximum. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, any comments on it? So, Maybe because you are a student and you are thinking of your future, what do you want to do once you are ready with your university studies and you want to work at a university maybe, and the highest level I guess you can reach on a university would be to become a professor. So I thought maybe looking at you and your future, let's take a bit more realistic example instead of uh, looking at somebody who's doing the Paralympics or somebody in my field of study getting a brain damage. So I know somebody at the university who has a disease of the retina. So in the retina, in the eye, you have all these sensory cells and they help you process visual information which can give you vision. But this person has a retinal disease which on the level of functions make it only a percentage of vision of 10%. And due to this loss of vision, this person is not able to drive a car and not able to read anything which is small, like a telephone or a recipe or whatever, if you want to buy clothes, uh, the, the size of the clothes. But 
Despite these disabilities, you could say there could be disabilities, this person is a professor at this university, and that's more the professional role, but also this person likes to travel around the world, um, which was a bit difficult, of course, in the last two years, but that was for another reason, that was for an environmental reason, right? <laughs> um, what I do know about this person is that in the personal factors, this person is very resilient, very persistent. Uh, it's somebody who is a positive human being, very optimistic, uh, has an active coping style, so kind of a problem solver. A, a problem is nice to have because then you have something to solve. And on the other hand, in the environment, there's a lot of support, a support from peers, but also support because this person has aids, visual aids, which can help uh, to make something readable anyway. The driving will never happen with 10% vision, but there are a lot of aids which can help. Do you think this is reachable? If you look at the moment now in your studies, you're studying and maybe you're dreaming of a career at the university. Maybe there is somebody in the audience who also has a visual impairment. Do you think this is a realistic example? Is this person actually working at our university <laughs> or did I make it up? <laughs> uh, for me, it's realistic, for sure. And I'm, I'm glad that that person works at our university. Uh, we also have students with visual impairments and yeah. or uh, doing great during the study. So with uh, what you uh, also mentioned with the uh, right environmental and, and, and personal circumstances, yeah, it can work for yeah. sure. And that's, yeah, very, I think it's, uh, it has to be normal and it, it shouldn't be a question, maybe. Yeah, I can imagine, yeah. Any other, maybe somebody on the chat? No. Also with the resilience part, right? The, the resilience part, if we're referring to the same person, I, I think I know whom you're referring to. Um, that gentleman once said that, um, or that person, excuse me, that person once said, um, have I been lucky or unlucky in that sense? Uh, with the, that was a question uh, that a person was posing, have I been lucky or unlucky uh, with what I've been dealt, the cards I've been dealt, and he explained two certain angles you can look at it, and that person looks at it from a completely, yeah, from a very, very, um, how can I say this, amazing standpoint of saying the cards I've been dealt, it's what I make of it and my environment. And that's then leading back to what we've been talking about, personal circumstances and the environment. And uh, that's a, a good way to look at it, to be honest. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 There's someone here who says, yes, they can work here. And there's also someone saying it is possible, but I can imagine that it is really hard to achieve this. Yeah. Are there still people upstairs? Yeah. Do you want to join? in the discussion? <laughs> <laughs> For me, the question then uh, pops up is like, uh, how did the support and the aids that were needed uh, were given? Were they available in general or how did that go? That's like the first thing that then triggers Comes my attention. Yeah. 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 I think this links nicely to another comment here saying it's also hard to imagine because there's not a lot of visibility. So I guess in that way, it's hard to imagine because you don't know what process someone's gone through and how they've gotten to that point of getting that aid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I said when I started this workshop that there were two reasons for doing this workshop. So one was professionally and one was personally. So professionally, it's because I study the consequence of brain damage and I'm really involved in the people who, who are living every day with the consequences of the brain damage. But the other reason for doing this is that that is me. <laughs> so I'm the person here and it's all true what is said here. 
So this is me. So what I wanted to do, I spoke to Netty when, when we talked about what I could do for the community, for the unlimited network. Um, and I said, I don't want to be the professor with on my head, uh, I'm the one with a disability. <laughs> it just doesn't feel right for me. So I decided, no, but I, what I do want to be is a, an example for people who are in the students' network, who want to maybe become a staff member at this university. So shoot, what do you think of it? What questions? Any question is available if, if you want to talk to me on how I got there, <laughs> about the support and the aids. Um, that's a struggle. Every aid is a struggle. <laughs> I'll get them here. <laughs> I, I always memorize my slides <laughs> just to tell you how I cope. So the only reason I can read is by using my special glasses. So these, uh, these, these just uh, magnify, but, but you cannot magnify something which is just not readable. So there is a limit to what I can read and you can imagine that when you're a professor you need to read all the time. So on the one hand, for me, when it, the world became more digital, it became easier. So you can imagine nothing changed in my vision, but some things in the environment make it easier because you can magnify everything on your screen. So I never print anything anymore. I always say to people I work with, never bring printed papers to meetings, cannot read them. So I read them from the screen and I make it as big as I can. But on the other hand, everybody walking around with all the tiny electronic stuff, the other part of digital life, that's horrible. Because um, I, there's suddenly a lot of things I can't do anymore in society. And, and I have to say, I just go with the flow. Now that I become older, I realize that sometimes in life it may be difficult, but maybe it will become later on, it will become better. So just to give you an idea on going by train in the Netherlands, you used to go to a ticket office. That was the best part of my life. You just go to a ticket office, you ask somebody else to do the vision part. You just say, I want to travel to Utrecht, back and forth. Uh, so give me a ticket. And that was the easy part. And then they started making these machines, but they were these machines with codes. And I don't know if the people remember that, but those codes actually were the postal codes of cities in the Netherlands. And many people didn't know that. So what I just did was memorize all the codes that I wanted to travel to. So I knew that Utrecht, for instance, is 3500 <laughs> and I just always pressed the same buttons <laughs> and then they moved to these touch screens and I just couldn't do anything with that because there was nothing in there to make it bigger <laughs> so that was that was the worst part of traveling for me but now we are living with these cards where you just go on a stick and then what is so nice because I can hear very well is that when you want to go on the train, it beeps once. And when you want to go off, it beeps twice. And many people don't know that. And I know, but there are two problem situations. And that is in Utrecht, there are like 25 of these things where you can go through. So I can't hear my own one. <laughs> so I don't know whether I'm checked out or not. And also for some reason in some trains or buses in the Netherlands, they changed it. So they said, no, two beeps is getting in, one beep is getting out. I really hate that. <laughs> but now I just use this self-chargeable thing. I never charge it because I can't charge it. I can't activate anything on these machines. So ju I, just, I just go with the beeps. <laughs> so here I see that the environment constant ch constantly changes and I always have to go with the flow. It's the same as when on a when you want to order a coffee at the bakery, for instance, at the university building 40, you have to look above the people who serve the coffee, what they serve. Well, I can't read that. I just, so I always order the same. <laughs> or I ask somebody, can you tell me what is there? <laughs> so kind of, I always try to get around it. 
But what I find out is that I think I'm where I am today because of my personal factors, more than my environmental factors. So getting these glasses is giving me a lot of frustration, it takes me two years. I file complaints against hospitals and everything, so my resilience I also need for getting all the aids <laughs> that I need to function normally. Yeah. I firstly have a couple of people uh, saying thank you for sharing your disability and disclosing this and appreciating that you're willing to be open about your impairment and therefore yeah. being a role model. Um, there is one question from someone asking, did you have a good support system throughout your earlier years? Um, and what influence did that have on you? Um, and then this person also says separately, that it's such a different perspective to what people with, with full vision are used to. So your story is about, uh, yeah, the train. But no, so the question being, did you have a good support system throughout your earlier years? And what influence did it have on you? Um, I didn't because um, I started to lose my vision at around the age of 10 or 11. We don't know for sure, it's a degenerative situation. Um, and for some reason, my teacher in school, she saw that I started to like look a bit weird and it looked as if I couldn't read the board anymore in the class. And my father saw that at home, I started sitting closer to the television. So what I was about 11 and they gave me glasses <laughs> and I didn't wear them because I said, can't see anything with the glasses. <laughs> and, and then they thought, well, of course you're in puberty and you, you don't want to be seen with glasses. <laughs> so nobody, nobody believed me. So um, at the age of say 15, <laughs> um, my father said, well, then maybe we can give you contact lenses if you don't want to wear the gl these glasses. And so we went to this shop and this guy said to my father, your daughter doesn't need contact lenses nor glasses. There's something else wrong. You need to go to a somebody, a eye doctor. <laughs> I forgot the word for that. O ophthalmologist, I think. Yeah. So you need to go to an ophth ophthalmologist. And then we had this very old lady, very nice, but very old. And she just said, well, you have bleached neurons. Well, I have no idea what that is. And that's not a story to go back to school with. Like, I can't do a test because I have bleached neurons. <laughs> so uh, nobody believed me <laughs> still. And what I did was become more resilient and I developed a very good memory, <laughs> I guess. And that's how I got through school. And then when I was 23, um, I was invited by the University of Amsterdam for some reason to join a scientific research project. I said, well, what the heck, <laughs> let's join. And then suddenly they gave me a diagnosis. So at the age of 23, say 12 years later, I got a disease. <laughs> and suddenly I was able to tell people, well, I can't see very well because, and I could tell them I have what they call juvenile macular de degeneration. Um, so. It's not only indeed what you said, for some people it's important to know the cause. As long as you don't know the cause, <laughs> people do just don't believe you. <laughs> so I guess from the moment I had the diagnosis, suddenly there appeared to be visual aids. <laughs> so if you don't know what you have, you don't know what you need to have a better way of functioning. And then I was already halfway my psychology studies. <laughs> so very good support, no, <laughs> not in this area. But on the other hand, um, when I was very young, my mother was very ill and she also passed away when I was 15. So I had a lot of support, mental support in that area, especially for my father. And I guess that mental support also helped me with the other part. So my mother was ill and I started losing my eyesight and how do you deal with that? <laughs> Yeah, so it wasn't easy, but I'm a positive person. So for me, the glass is always half full. I always see chances. I always see opportunities. I also see bears along the way, if that's an English expression. But mostly I think I'm driven by the positive part of it. I do have to say that two years ago, and that was last Sunday, two years ago, that 
society was locked down. For the first time in my life, I encountered that my resilience was at the end. So I have a feeling that the whole day, I always have to look for solutions, how to do things all the time, because there's always a situation which I may not be able to see. And then suddenly everything was online. I had to teach online, I had to meet online, and everything was small, and I couldn't see anybody anymore. I had no idea who I was talking to, who I was teaching to. And then for the first time in my life, I said, I can't do this. So I had a few rough months in 2020, say from March till June. But then people started telling me, well then, call in sick. <laughs> I was like, what kind of adv advice is that? <laughs> I'm, not going, I'm not sick, I'm just struggling. And every week they were proposing, I don't know if you remember that, they were proposing other systems. So first we needed Zoom and then we got Teams and then we got, and I said, stop, please stop. I can't, I can't learn new systems every week. One system is enough. And when I started expressing that, all the other people said, yes, we feel the same. <laughs> yeah. So what I, and I have a feeling that in all these years, my life has been stable. And then if we think of the definition of health is the ability to adapt and to self-manage, it really felt for the first time in years that I had to adapt again. <laughs> and I didn't like it. But I'm smiling and I'm there and it's two years further and we'll get there. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> No other questions yet, but uh, just, yeah, a lot of, yeah, thanks for sharing your stories and people sharing their experiences of not realizing the barriers until uh, they are confronted with that themselves or a close family member or someone close to them and then realizing, for example, someone saying, I only started noticing all the mobility barriers after their mum had an operation requiring a temporary Zimmer frame, for example. Um, but yeah, and realizing that there's amazing resilience required and a lot of extra energy and perseverance because it takes a lot of energy uh, and executive function work to yeah. overcome those barriers. And again, another message saying thank you for sharing your personal experiences. Yeah, yeah. Did you also feel a lot of distrust because you mentioned that people didn't believe you? Yeah, yeah, you start doubting yourself, like, hmm, am I faking this or what is wrong? And, and I was still very insecure about the future. Um, I think this degenerative process stopped about around when I was 23, but it, as it started, it goes so slowly, you don't know exactly where it stopped, but they started measuring my vision and it kept on being stable. But now that I'm older, I also have what old people have, uh, that you need reading glasses. <laughs> but So I, 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 st I still see worse <laughs> than I did. I, I couldn't read it any anyway, but now I can't read it anymore anyway anymore. So yeah, that was kind of a bummer. <laughs> um, and I'm kind of, I'm not looking forward to it, but I know I need to prepare for a future where I may not be able to live and work on this level of being a professor at this university, working like 50 hours a week. I can't be able doing to do that until I'm 67 or something. So I need to prepare for earlier slowing down. I also like to cycle. So we already, my husband and me, we already thought about tandem cycle so I can be in the back. So I'm already preparing a bit for I'm not sure how future will come, but yeah. But um, is that because you will you might lose your sight 100% mm, no. or that's not, it's... No. Why it's do you think you cannot work until uh, you retire? Because of the energy. Oh, the energy. It, it costs me so much energy to do the same as people who have normal vision that I'm constantly complaining about being tired. <laughs> and there, there, I think there will be a limit to where I would say it's not worth it anymore. But um, I'm a bit too passionate about my work. So I have a feeling that I'm capable of saying no, 
it's not that I don't want to dare to say no and I'm on a position in a university well now whenever I don't want to do something I just say no I don't feel that I need to uh, establish who I am and I'm comfortable where I am um, I just don't say no because I like everything too much still so that's more of a personal struggle that in terms of energy I'm doing too much yeah like a part-time professor position that's not yeah sure it's okay. just I can't do it ah. it's all or nothing I guess um, um, I said to my husband a few years ago I think I want to work four days a week uh, and he said well good idea but maybe before you change your contract and get less paid try to work for 40 hours every week for what you're paid for and then do that for a month <laughs> and then let's talk about doing less. And then I said, a whole month? Only from nine to five, five days a week? So it's in me. So that's the, I think the other side of the resilience and the active coping style, there, there can also be a flip side to it, which I'm aware to, yeah. <laughs> So what I think is very interesting, because I'm um, not sure, because I'm not your generation, your students, but I think we do see that people, younger generation, choose for a different work-life balance. Yeah. So, um, so my husband's also from your generation and they're working so many hours. But it, and maybe the others can answer this. Do you think you can be a professor for like four days a week? And would you think like, well, of course, we could do that. And then uh, just say, okay, 32 hours a week, that's it. I say yes. <laughs> yeah. I hope, I hope. I think it's a culture change that uh, is needing to happen for that. Yeah, this time this is from me and not yet a comment from the audience. Um, but I think that, I really do see this culture change, uh, also comparing my working experience to my parents' working experience. And yeah, I'm quite happy to cut off my work day at the end of the day. Okay, I'm not in an academic position, um, but even my peers who are PhD students mm -hmm. um, are starting to break beyond these barriers of like, well, a PhD student works Monday to Sunday, nine till nine or nine, nine mm -hmm. till 10 at night. Um, and say, no, my, mm, these are my work hours. And I'm, yeah. as much as I'm passionate about what I do uh, for work, I'm allowed to also be passionate in my work hours and also be passionate about other things on the side. And yeah, yeah I hope that this is uh, continuing. Um, and there's just one comment here right, not right now saying, there have been trials of four days a week that have been very successful in a few cities, countries, and companies. Um, and I yeah. personally am very happy with the four days a week as well. Yeah, <laughs> I also, I, I, I fully agree. I think it's, it should be doable. I know there are part-time professors. I mean, there are people who work as a doctor and then are part-time professor. And so that's not the issue, I guess. It's more in me. And also that some people may say I'm a workaholic, <laughs> but on the other hand, when I sit down on Sunday morning and I think, well, I read a paper somewhere in a journal, scientific journal, and I just don't agree. <laughs> and I want to write a letter to the editor saying that I don't agree. <laughs> that's fun. That's not work. <laughs> For me, that's fun. <laughs> Nobody tells me to do that, right? So those, and I edit books, I write book chapters, I'm actually writing a book. Um, that's because I want to do it and not because the targets of me being a professor say I need to do that. And there I really like this new reward and recognition uh, thing. So what I always say is within the boundaries, like I have these targets as a professor, what I need to do to keep the university satisfied, I do that. I do that way within less than 40 hours. <laughs> And then I have the freedom to do everything else that I like to do <laughs> because I like to do it. Yeah, yeah. So it's more in me, I guess. Yeah, I think I'm more presenting me than, than the professor. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, do you have uh, tips for students who struggle to get the right support or find the right aids, which then maybe results in their coping? 
changing in ways as a result of it. Do you have tips for them uh, how to yeah. be optimistic or more resilient in a way? Yeah. Well, how it may be very difficult. I, I find it still difficult, but ask for help. Don't make it your own journey. There are many people here at the university who really want to help, but they can't help if they don't know that you seek help. So um, I just sometimes try to do that and, I, and, and then maybe also use the network and the disability support to get the help for you. Um, if, if you can't do it on your own, let other people help you to do it. I think that is the main, because it's horrible to get support and aids. It's bureaucratic. You have to go through too many people. Uh, I once got very angry when I said I wanted an adaptation in my workspace. It's like, I think I saw everybody at the university and I was so angry about that, that I wrote a very, not very nice column about it. <laughs> um, and well, just, yeah, ask for help. Make it noticeable that there is still a long way to go. Yeah, unfortunately, yeah, we can't solve that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we, we should solve that, but <laughs> we can't solve it tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. But we are, we are getting there. Things are improving. Mm. Yeah, and especially people need to be aware. Um, and I never feel like a victim. I mean, of course, I would have loved to have 100% eyesight, but that's just suddenly didn't happen. <laughs> so I, I'm not a victim. Um, and I have just as much right to be a professor at this university as anybody else. <laughs> I guess that's where I come from. And I think raising awareness is very important. <laughs> Nettie yesterday wrote me an email with all the details for today and you told me where to park. <laughs> I don't drive. <laughs> so even people who are, are still, I mean, you have your heart on the right place, right? Where, it's, where it comes to disability. But then even still then you tend to forget because it's just not visible from the outside. <laughs> and that's really a pitfall. <laughs> So I try to find the balance between not always asking, um, raising awareness for it. Um, I, lose, I use a lot of jokes <laughs> um, to make it a bit more light, but when it's necessary, I tell it. <laughs> and that's how I, and I decide when I tell it. That is a decision I made. <laughs> and I decide when I need help. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I actually be thinking like um, because of this like disease, um, it just sometimes have the feeling that you always have to explain yourself. For example, I have dyslexia, and I feel like uh, because you don't see it directly that sometimes people, uh, yeah, ask you why, for example, you read slower or yeah, yeah. or like you don't see it like I quite sometimes get annoyed by like people uh, uh, for some reason people I always want to like an explanation why like you're like not in the standard and I guess like especially if you're like uh, like studying with like uh, on the university I think there's quite a chance that like you get asked quite a lot or like uh, why you yeah, handle some stuff some way yeah mm. I I don't explain it I just tell, <laughs> yeah, I just say, well, can you get me coffee because I can't push the buttons. I just say it, <laughs> yeah. A apparently, I'm op somewhere in me, there's something, well, you have to deal with it because I already dealt with it. <laughs> so I just put the problem outside. <laughs> I just, yeah, does that help? I mean, yeah. What I do really hate is when people 
think when I say, can you help me because I can't see very well, that they start talking louder and easier. <laughs> they even do that on um, Schiphol Airport. I once asked for help. I can't, can never read the screen, so I can't see where my plane leaves from. And they start behaving like I'm a moron or something. <laughs> and I always say, well, I just, just can't read. <laughs> I, I, I can move around and I'm capable of remembering an airplane number <laughs> and a gate. Yeah, yeah. so that, that is really, a, that I always think that's really annoying, but that is about awareness. Yeah. Um, I, have one yeah. So I have one more question uh, because I have the feeling that there is a more awareness uh, about it recently, like the couple last years. Do you agree? Has there been more awareness? Yes, and that is because the number of people living with diseases, chronic diseases or disabilities is in increasing, right? Because um, um, medical care, technology and medical care is improving, but that, that means that more people survive diseases and the other side of it is that more people are living with the consequences of the disease. So people without anything are very becoming very rare. Mm -hmm. And then it becomes more normal to talk about that. Yeah, I, I really see that. Yeah, yeah. I guess that's possible. Two, two sides to it, right? <laughs> I, I also, if, if there would be a transplantation for retina, I think I would be the first to get it. <laughs> but since we don't have that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't get me wrong, it's not that I, I... It is part of my identity. I can't take it away anymore. But it would be nice if it wouldn't be there. And that is something which is also really underestimated. I know that in our hospital they do epileptic surgery and imagine that there are people who grew up being a patient, a person who always needs to be aware that whenever I go outside or when I go to a restaurant or when I'm in a room where other people are, may get an epileptic seizure. So having epileptic seizures becomes your identity and also the identity of people around you, like your parents or brothers and sisters. And then they take it away and then the surgeon really thinks that the day after the operation you can live a normal life. But that's the other way of adaptation, right? You can't be suddenly somebody who isn't aware anymore of or anticipating on an epileptic seizure. So even there, I think that was the first time I realized that it could also be the other way around. It's, it's very good how you can adapt and self-manage, but that also makes who you are in society. <laughs> Yeah, just just suddenly when you take away the seizures, you become somebody else. <laughs> no, you can't. So yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much for having me. That I could share my story and my also my professional view. And I wish you all very much luck with your studies. And whenever you want to reach me or you have a question or the network wants to join or talk with me, I'm open for that. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, we were very happy that you wanted to uh, be our first uh, professor to give lectures yeah. like this. We loved it. We have some oh, flowers for you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Beautiful. And, uh, uh, dear Caroline, we would like to thank you wholeheartedly for your invaluable and insightful collaboration. We are proud to be able to launch your first event of the year with this crucial lecture, supported by your allyship to UM's disabled community. Our warmest regards the Unlimited Students core team. Thank you very much. You are. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I want to thank everyone uh, who also joined online and yes. for the persons who are here in person. Um, we will still send out a survey about today's lecture and also about future topics or events potentially, so we hope that you will fill in that. 
And yeah, we hope to see you at our uh, next event. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Live stream off.